All right. Hi, Rachel and Julie. How are y'all doing today? Awesome. Are you, are you as excited as I am for this this fantastic webinar? We are uh, so excited to have you all here. Uh, for those of you that are just joining, uh, you are the, you know, I, when I do a webinar, I always like log in right at the hour. So you all are two minutes early and we are super thrilled to have you. We're going to be started uh, starting here at, wait, is it 2 p.m.? No, yes. Yes, <laughs> this Pacific thing, uh, it, sometimes I have to do the math in my head, which is hard without uh, enough coffee, but we will be starting here at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, for those of you who are with me uh, on the West Coast, that would be 11 a.m. And if you're with um, Julie in Chicagoland and Austin, Texas with Rachel, I believe that would make it 1 p.m. your time. Um, so we'll get started here in a moment. Julie and Rachel, how are you doing this morning? Good. So good. So yeah. good. Just really happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Can you believe we're talking about Christmas in August? It's like crazy, but like we're probably kind of a little bit late, aren't we? We should have been. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna Thanks. we're gonna get everyone caught up today. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Oh, lots of folks in California. William, I'm in Austin too. Yes, hot as usual. It's like we've been living on the face of the sun. And we're oh, Napa and Dallas and Philly and wow, Minnesota. Yeah, Goodness. Right. I'm I'm jealous of my Napa peeps. Man, I got to I got to have a little wine tasting in California this summer in I'm gonna try to pronounce this correctly. Ohio Valley. Yeah. Um delicious. Gotta try a delicious rose. Oh, and mm. Santa Barbara so beautiful oh someone's in marco island florida um awesome look at this There's st johnsbury vermont wow. tell me my my st johnsbury is is that where the boarding school is in st john I, I think it's called st johnsbury boarding school you can let me know if i've got that right wine and wow. finger lakes new york is worth a visit huh. yeah it's where the academy is i had a girlfriend that went to st johnsbury academy and now her daughter is going uh -huh. yeah, there you go. Well, we people from all over. over. <laughs> oh, go ahead. What are you saying, Julie? <laughs> all right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. I know that you all have a ton of amazing content for us to cover today, so I want to make sure that we're respectful of your time and that we're getting all of our participants um, all of this really great information. So, uh, super excited to have you. I'm going to jump in here with some housekeeping. Uh, information. So first of all, for those of you who are with us live, we um, will also be recording this. So the uh, recording and slides will be emailed to you later today. So be on the lookout um, in your inbox and uh, you'll have links to view the recording as well as uh, download the slides. Um, as far as uh, questions go, please use that Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom control panel. Um, that is where Rachel and Julie will be um, looking at the questions. We'll be answering some questions. Uh, and um, the chat is great to talk amongst yourselves. Um, and there may be some opportunities to use that like we were doing here in the beginning here where uh, we asked you all where you were, um, where you were based. So super excited. Feel free to continue to uh, fill that out if you haven't already. If you want to follow along, you can follow along on Twitter uh, at hashtag Bloomering or at uh, Bloomering Tech, often uh, posting all sorts of great uh, fundraising uh, resources for our followers. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, or if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you all, my name is Josh Meyer. I am the VP of Demand Generation over at Bloomerang, and Bloomerang is a donor database and online fundraising platform. As you're looking at your uh, end of the year fundraising, and so we're going to be talking about copywriting and uh, appeals and emails this year or today, um, and you're looking at how how do I manage all this and how do I uh, you know send some of those emails out? Bloomerang is a great option. We'd love to find some time to learn more about how we might be able to partner with you and your organization. Um, you can reach us at bloomerang.co or there's that uh, URL at the bottom, bloomerang.co slash demo. And one of our uh, team members will be happy to follow up and schedule some time to 
learn more about your fundraising and how we might be able to partner. Um, I did that super fast because we have some super amazing content. And with that, it is my pleasure to hand this over uh, to Rachel and Julie, who are going to awesome. um, kick us off here. Yay. I'm so excited to get to be with all of you today. And I know I speak for Julie, who feels the same way. We're super excited. This is such a great topic and we have so much great information to share with you. M my name is Rachel. Um, you probably, hopefully you've heard my voice before. If you haven't, I'm super excited to meet you and get to know you. You can learn more about me at rachelmere.com. I absolutely love helping fundraisers save time, raise more money and delight their donors. I have gotten to meet Oprah and touch her and it was like the most exciting 30 seconds of my life getting a hug from Oprah. My background's in nonprofits. I started a nonprofit to empower girls in math, science, engineering, and technology, and they're celebrating their 25th anniversary. Like many of you, uh, I am thrilled that my kids are out of the house and back in school, <laughs> and um, I'm just excited to be with you and get to share lots of really great fundraising tips around end-of-year fundraising today. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. I am Julie Cooper. You can learn more about me at fundraisingwriting.com. So I'm a, a fundraising copywriter for great causes, and I just love copywriting and designing, especially fundraising pieces just to the moon and back. So, and I just, I love doing um, these sorts of trainings that will really help you all write better appeals. So you can just hit all your targets and fund all your programs and, um, and end the year really strong. So that's me. So I just want to remind you guys um, that um, you can, you're going to get the handouts, but if you want your hands on them right this very second, you can download them. I've got them up, uh, rachelmuir.com forward slash handouts. We're going to, I'm going to be talking about money draining mistakes. And I'm going to show you some examples of that, that I want you to avoid this end of year so that you can raise the most money possible. Julie is going to show you five tests and she's got an awesome download um, of these five tests for you. And I've got a checklist too. So you're leaving this webinar with everything that you need to rock your appeal. I'm pretty sure I've got an end of year makeover in here. Um, I might, if I don't, if I don't, but I may, I think I do. Um, but uh, I've also got a checklist and we've got Julie's cheat sheet and we have some time at the end for Q&A. So we are going to get things started here. Uh, again, type your questions into the Q&A box and we are going to do our best to answer all of them live. And we're going to be chatting you up today in the chat box. This is where you can grab Julie's cheat sheet and I'm going to pop it into the chat as well. But this is your cheat sheet. She's going to be going over um, five different um, tests for you to do. I'll let Julie pop it in this chat. Julie's going to go over five different tests for you to do, um, and uh, it's going to help you take your offer over the top. I've got a checklist as well, and this has, I think, 21 different items here. I'm popping this into the chat for you. Um, and um, and so that is a really great way um, to make sure that your end of year appeal is ready to go. Um, I have a program called the League of Extraordinary Fundraisers. And if you enjoy this workshop and you want a little bit of training from me, uh, I've just put the link in there. I do we do a workshop every single month. And uh, we're actually doing a workshop on Thursday on major gift fundraising. And then we're going to be continuing the end of year fundraising conversation <laughs> through September and October. This is the giving season and we're super excited. All of us here, Bloomering included, is super excited for you to make the most of it. And you can learn more at leagueofextraordinaryfundraisers.com. I'm also going to pop this into the chat as well. I have a um, really cool new uh, program that I haven't, uh, We I did this two years ago and it was a big hit and I brought it back. And it's basically to help you become your own fantastic fundraising copywriter. And you get a template on how to write an end of year appeal, both a direct mail appeal and an email appeal. You use the template, you write your appeal, 
and then you submit it and a professional copywriter rewrites your appeal. So that just went live today. And if you're interested, you can learn more at um, that link. I just popped it into the chat. Um, Julie has an awesome free newsletter. Honestly, it is one of the best if not the best um, fundraising newsletter I've ever read. It is chock full of so many great pieces of advice. Um, it's amazing. It is totally worth signing up for. You can sign up at fundraisingwriting.com, but every single, I guarantee you, her newsletter will make you smile. It'll make you laugh. Uh, there's a lot of really great gifts in there and it'll give you a lot of really great um great stuff that you can use and you can check it out at fundraisingwriting.com. I will pop that into the chat. Well, I'll let Julie pop fundraisingwriting.com into the chat. Okay. So we're going to do some polls so that we can find out how things are going with you and your fundraising. And Sarah is going to be launching these. So I'm going to invite you guys to participate in these polls so we can find out what's going on with your end of year fundraising. All right, so um, Sarah, can you get the first one fired up here? There we go. All right, so Rachel and Julie, can you see it? Yeah, so this is my first question. We've got five poll questions, friends. Just let us know which one's you. You've already written and proved and tested and scheduled your end of year fundraising appeals and it's ready to go out the door and you are just rocking and rolling with your superhero cape on. Option two is you've got a draft, you've got some good ideas. And option three is I haven't even started. I cannot wait to see where people have landed. I think I might take a photo of this. So we're letting you guys vote. Let us know. 80%. Should we go ahead and end that and share the results? Yeah. All right. Share the results. Oh my goodness. 78% of you guys. We've got five people who've already done it. I'm like, like, jazz hands for the people that have already done it super super jazz hands i'm giving you all a virtual hug i'm giving everyone a virtual hug if you have a draft you're in a great place if you have a draft, you're in a great place um but we want it's august 16th we want you guys to um have your best year ever so thanks for being here we're going to launch our second poll question to find out where you guys are what's your budget so i broke this down to be a lot smaller um we'd asked this last year and so you, you know zero dollars i don't have anything to spend on this oh kelly finished her appeal today less than 2500 you know somewhere between 2500 and one dollar and five thousand 5,001 to 10,000, 10,000 to 20,000, or over 20,000. So let us know what your budget for end of year fundraising is. That's how much money you're going to spend on end of year fundraising. You're going to spend this money with your copywriting, your design, your mailing, your postage. You are spending, this is money you're actually spending on your expenses for end of year fundraising. All right. Let's go ahead and wrap that one up and we'll see the results. Okay. So, okay. Okay. This is interesting. So it looks like the big majority of you guys are spending like 55% of you are spending less than $2,500 and 21% of you are spending somewhere, um, but a little 2,501 to 5,000. So that is really, really good to know where you guys are at. We've got another poll question. Our third question. Thanks for participating. We're nerds. <laughs> Well, I'm a nerd. Okay, tell us what is your goal. So first we asked you what you're going to spend. It looks like most of you guys are going to spend somewhere between, you know, under 2,500 to 5,000. What are you expecting to raise? Maybe you don't have a goal, 5,000 or less, 5,000 to 15,000, 15,001 to 25,000. So type in there and, and pick maybe someone on here is like, rocking and rolling and, and thinks they're going to raise a million dollars. And I hope that you do, but take, let us know what is your revenue goal? What are you going to take home from your end of year fundraising? All right. Should go ahead and end that poll there. What do we got? Okay. This one is so interesting. Okay. I got to do this because 55% of you guys are spending less than $2,500 and 22% of you are expecting to raise 25,000 
to $50,000. 18% of you, the next highest percentage, expect to raise $50,000 to $100,000. So you guys have some very great uh, goals. And for those 25 people that didn't set one, hey, it's not too late. I mean, I encourage you to set one. We're going to get to the next poll question right now. So, you know, um, looks like you guys are anticipating some super high ROI based on what you're planning to spend. And I hope that you get there. So this is the one that I really am the most curious about next to the next question. <laughs> and I know Julie might be as well. Do you do your own stunts? Meaning, do you write your own appeals in-house? Do you contract with a fundraising copywriter like the amazing Julie Cooper? Or do you work with a full service agency that writes your appeals and does your segmentation and your printing and your mailing and all that good stuff? So let us know which one is you. I can't wait to read the results here. Thanks you I'm guys like, for participating. I'm fascinated on like, see, now this is me geeking out and nerding out, like doing some cross tabs on all this stuff and seeing where, where the intersections are. But you know, that's for another, that's, we could do a whole nother webinar on that. <laughs> we could, this is a mind blowing. 96% of you do all your own stunts and you write all your own appeals. So I'm going to, I'm going to stress to you guys and, and we are going to load up the next question, which is like one of my all-time favorite questions. I just popped into the chat, the checklist. And I also popped into the chat. I'm going to pop in all these links here. The, uh, the appeal makeover. I want you guys to check all this out and make sure you've got all these awesome resources um, in case you get stuck with your end of year fundraising. Okay. How many appeals do you send? Yeah, so this is combined, guys. This is direct mail and email. So combined, maybe you're sending three direct mail appeals and 10 email appeals combined. How many are you sending? So let me know that. Yeah. Type it in. Rachel, this is year end only, right? We're, we had a couple of questions. This is just year end. Yeah, this isn't the whole year. Thank you for asking that. This is not the whole year. This yeah. is just. Um, just the year end. Perfect. Year end. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also going to pop in Giving Tuesday and year end. Yeah. Pop it in there. And one other thing is we've had a couple of comments in there about, the, about all these links that we're dropping in the chat. All of this is embedded in the presentation and we'll be sending that out. So if you're yeah, want to be focused, you're not, you're not trying to just focus on the presentation, not to worry. All of this great content will be available to you um, after, after the presentation. All right. Ooh. Oh, okay. So we've got, okay. It looks like the vast majority of everyone is two to three appeals that they're sending out. And I even had a few people say, oh, I did it for the whole year. My fundraising friends, this is where every single one of you can improve. Uh, I think I have Julie, I think Julie just mm -hmm. my, in my own mind reading state, which is the amazing Julie Cooper and with the amazing Josh, and Sarah, we all want, am I right? We all want you to send more appeals. More, we all, send more. More, more, more. We want you to write good content and we want you to send more of it because you know what? Your donors, I know this is hard. So take a deep breath, guys. Your donors do not read every email that you send. If for some reason you don't believe me when I tell you that, log in to Bloomerang or whatever system you're using and look at your open rate. I guarantee you it's probably somewhere around 30%. That means 70% of your donors didn't even read the email. They're not going to read the email unless it's a subject line that really grabs them and makes them want to open it. So that is why you have to A, write great fundraising appeals and B, send more of them because not every message will get through. All right, well, I'm gonna uh, hit the road here and be talking about these uh, common mistakes that I want you to avoid. And uh, and then I'm handing the floor to Julie. Oh, yes. Oh yeah, do the next poll. I'm sorry, Sarah. Okay, this is for this is for Josh and Sarah because everyone at Bloomerang has a heart for segmentation. <laughs> do you segment your appeals based on your audience? As in like, donors, prospects, you know, lapsed donors, monthly donors, uh, do you do segmentation? So yes or no? Uh, music You're going to make Bloomberg happy if you say yes. <laughs> and if you say no, because it's too hard, then we should talk because we can help yeah. you make it easier. <laughs> Yay. Randy does it. Oh, John Button says we should. 
Brittany says her answer is no. I could do a whole webinar just on segmentation. I know. I do a present. I'm actually going to, I'm in Arizona AFP speaking about this on Thursday. So talk about hot. So kudos to the 56%. I mean, I think Josh's heart is happy and Sarah's too, that at least the majority of you guys are doing segmentation. Segmentation and personalization are ginormously huge and important, my fundraising friends, because the greatest gift you can give your donor is the gift of being known by you. And let me tell you, when Julie and I get an email and Josh and Sarah too, and it's all about the gala that happened that we didn't go to because uh, I live in Austin and Julia lives in Chicago and your nonprofits in California. And you're saying, thanks for coming out to the great event last night. We're like, who are these people? I didn't go to an event <laughs> unless I slept walked to California, which I don't think I did. So please segmentation, personalization, did very, very important. And I know there's tons of resources Glimmering has to help you out with that. Yeah, there's a so, great comment from, uh, was it Elise in here, who said, uh, thanks, sir, Rachel, we segment and are so happy with our results. People think we are actually are writing to them personally. So if that's yes, that's the important. goal. Yeah. That's the goal. It's an ambitious goal. It's one I endeavor to achieve um, myself. It's an ambitious goal, but you can do it. Okay, here's the first problem. I'm going to go through these fast so I can hand the floor to Julie. Uh, but we do have enough time to stick around a little bit, you guys, uh, if we go over. So um, here's the first problem, a great wall of text. You have to maximize readability. This is a great wall of text. I can't even take all this in. This, I, I, it's just like, it's too hard. It's unfriendly to read. It creates a lot of what is co considered cognitive um, friction. You want cognitive ease. Think Pinterest. Pinterest is pure cognitive ease. This is an example of cognitive ease. Look at this white space in this appeal. Look how this first sentence is bolded. Um, you need to boost readability. Always use a 14 to 15 point font, one and a half line spacing, short sentences, short paragraphs. Your appeal needs to sound like a human being is talking to you. You know, you go to a fundraising event and your, your CEO or your executive director writes a speech and it sounds like something that sounds good on paper, but terrible when it comes out of their mouth because it's just too much. It's too academic. It's not conversational. This needs to be conversational. Very, very simple syntax. This is Julie's like love language. Um, she can take the most, she can transform appeals to really help people make it so easy to read. Um, another problem that I see is a problem with people having all kinds of like just a hot mess of on a donation form, the reply device. Now, Julie Cooper says, this is, this is in Julie's opinion, this is the most important part of the appeal is the reply device. And this is one thing that drives me crazy. Don't make your donor fill out all their information. This is like as unfriendly as a great wall of text. You know their information, you're communicating with them, have it be pre-filled for them. It needs to have an easy to read box that's checked, that has a compelling sentence of you like kind of joining the, the tribe here and, 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 and joining the action. A good call to action, 14 points, font, necessary information only, add a URL if people want to give online. Another problem, people using statistics in an appeal letter. Oh my goodness. Statistics appeal statistics depress emotion. They suppress it. Okay. You want to, and fundraising is all emotion. That's what it is. All fundraising is is a quest for empathy and numbers don't make me feel empathy. Numbers numb it. Um, people who read a story about a girl, one girl in her personal circumstances gave $2.38. The same appeal with statistics about the magnitude of the problems in the area, donors gave $1.14. I'm not making this up. This has been very, very well proven. Stories matter. Stories make a huge difference in your 
huge difference in your fundraising. It needs to be a story that isn't finished. And it needs to be a story that focuses on the donor and the donor solving the problem. Your appeal is not a report card about how great you are and all the great things that you did, because that makes me feel like, why should I give to you in the first place? You're doing really awesome. You totally don't even need me. This is, again, great walls of text. You want to have short sentences, one sentence, two sentences max in your paragraphs in an email, no more than three in an appeal. Alternate between things that you've got uh, bold and underlined. Um, my fourth tip is make sure your donor is in this story. That's what's going to make your donor want to read this story and continue reading this story and believe that they can actually help and make a difference. Every single piece of fundraising communications that you send your donor is a mirror. How are they going to look in it? Are they going to look great? Are they going to look like the generous, kind, compassionate human being that they are? It's up to you to put them in the story. This can't keep happening to dogs, Josh. We need your help to change this. He's a dog lover. You've put him in the story. <laughs> He's going to care about it. It's not about you. I know it's like that movie. It's, it's not you. It's me. It's your appeal is not about how wonderful you are. Your appeal is about how wonderful the donor is and how kind and compassionate and loving and big hearted your donor is. Your donor is the hero. You need the donor to make the gift. You don't need to be the hero. This is a really great example from Jeff Brooks. And this book, if you want to be better at your copywriting, and since 97% of you, my fundraising friends are doing your own stunts and writing your fundraising copywriting, get your hands on this book, How to Turn Your Words into Money. It's one of the best um, books on fundraising, uh, how to like tips for fundraising copywriting. And it's written by a copywriter. And this is what's also awesome about Julie Cooper and reading Julie Cooper's fantastic newsletter because she's a fundraising copywriter. So everything that she writes is so easy to read. But this is a great example of putting the donor in the appeal and reflecting in the appeal what a good person the donor is. When you see a homeless person sitting on a park bench or sleeping under a bridge, you wonder what you should do. That's the kind of person you are. That is like sending me a love bomb of like, yeah, I, I would wonder. That's the kind of person I am. I'm a good person. I mentioned this earlier. You've got to, you cannot tell a finished story. It can't, if you start out a story with drama and with challenges and with a, you know, a, a, a protagonist who is charming and who we want to help. And then you tell me that they're all better now. I'm like, well, you don't need me. Um, this one, um, she was re referred to suited for change and now she's working the job she's always wanted, exclamation mark. It's like, well, okay, she doesn't need any help now. A finished story tells the donor that they're not needed and they are needed. And in order to be the fantastic hero that we want them to be with their donation, they need a problem to solve. So uh, just like Susie and Dustin, and I guess this was season two of Stranger Things um, and their uh, never ending story. Uh, you remember when she's saying that so cute and Dustin too, adorable. You want to tell an unfinished story and it's the donor's gift. It's the donor rushing their gift that will finish the story and put a happy ending on the story. But the story needs to not be complete. The, it's, it's a cliffhanger. This drives me completely bananas. When I get fundraising appeals addressed to me, Rachel Muir here in Austin, Texas, and I open it up and it says, dear friend, I'm like, what? what? Like you mailed this letter to me at my house. How can you not know my name? This makes absolutely no sense. Or dear friends, plural, you mailed this letter to my house. You know my name and you know my address. Uh, don't do that. Personalization matters. It's an art form that you need to invest in, in your letters, in your emails as well, along with segmentation. You know their name. I absolutely 100% want you to use it. So I'm going to go through and, uh, and, and pass the baton to Julie here. And um, I'm super excited to hear about her five tests for your appeal. 
Thanks, Rachel. And um, yeah, so many good tips that you just gave, just so many golden nuggets there. And with what, what was it like 96% of people on this call right now are writing their own appeal. So this is exactly where you need to be. So I'm so glad that you're all here. Okay, so I'm going to be going through um, five tests for your appeal. Rachel, if you could um, move the slide once. Yes. Thanks. Or again, <laughs> here we go. Perfect. And so these are the five tests, the U test, faster test, easy test, offer test, and heart awakening test. And each of these tests, I mean, be behind each of these tests, there are real practical um, tactics that you can use, yeah, that have been used for years to raise money. So, so hope everyone is, is listening up and leaning in. So next slide, please. All right. So the U test. And the U test was developed by copywriter and, and author Tom Ahern. And it's immensely helpful um, for all of us in our fundraising. So when we're writing an appeal, we, we want to make sure that we're writing to the donor about what interests the donor. And what interests the donor is how they, the donor, can achieve all of these great things through our organizations. So the focus is on the person reading the appeal, not on your nonprofit. Now, Rachel already talked about this in length. So bottom lining it, the purpose of the U test is really to ensure that by, that by talking directly to the donor about their forthcoming impact, um, that they feel connected to the cause and they feel competent in their giving. And so basically they feel like they can make a difference. So see the first example here. So instead of we are saving lives, you want to say instead you are saving lives. So when we say we are saving lives, me meaning we meaning the organization, that creates a space between the donor and the impact. So there's kind of like this disconnect that you're building into your writing when you do that. Um, so you really want to make sure that your language really reflects just the amazing impact of the donor, just in really clear terms. You are saving lives. The donor can feel that and it's personal. So now let's look at the second and third examples here. So using the word you frequently in your appeal is good and, and it's a great start. So yes, do that. But you also wanna think about the you behind the money. So you want your appeal to care for the donor's well-being, like who they are as a person. That's what you want to be thinking about. So instead of writing, your gift is needed today, you write, you are needed today. And instead of writing, thank you for your donation, you could write, thank you for your compassion, right? So both of these rewrites um, speak to the donor's identity, not just their gift. So so really when your letter um, kind of centers around the person receiving the letter, you'll help them feel seen and cared for and understood, the you behind the wallet. Okay, next slide. And one way to conduct the you test would be to take a draft of your appeal like I did here of something my writing partner Brett wrote a couple of weeks ago and circle all the, all the you type words, you, your, and then you circle the we words and, and count them up. And here, uh, we, we exceeded that here. Uh, there were 29 you words and only six we words. So next slide, thanks. But luckily for all of us, Bloomerang has like this free and easy way to perform a you test. And so it's their donor centricity and readability tool. And it's found on their website. I have it on the bottom left-hand side of, of the screen. So all you do, all you have to do is take your draft, copy it, paste it in the box. And you don't have to format it, just copy it and paste it in ugly and click analyze. And the example I have here is of like a donor care, thank you letter. Um, that we wrote a, a few weeks ago. And you can see that at the right, this passes the test because U words were used 14 times and we words were used only three times. 
So with this letter, we can be confident that we are speaking to the donor, staying focused on the good that the donor is doing, right? Instead of like the great things we are doing as an organization. So it's a great tool to use. Be sure you go there and bookmark it and use it for your next appeal. Okay, the checklist. So here's a, a checklist. You can find it in uh, my bonus cheat sheet. Next, please. Thank you. Okay, so now we have the FASTER test. And the FASTER test, this one was also created by, by Tom Hearn. And so let me ask you this question. So think about, do you, when you're writing, do you earn your donor's attention and hold on to it for dear life? Or are you creating through your writing like a straight path to the exit door? So we all know that a donor's attention is fleeting, right? They're busy people just like you and I are. So you need to make sure that your writing engages them from the get-go. And that's the purpose of the FASTER test. So how do we do this? Well, let's look at subject lines. Oh, if you can go back one. Thanks, thanks. So if we can look at, we'll look at subject lines, uh, direct mail, and, and an opening of an appeal. All right, so uh, the first one, email. So here's a preview of um, an, an email preview. So this is what um, is typical of what a donor would see when they're looking at your email in their inbox. So first we have the from line. The best thing you can do is use a human sender name. It's the most prominent part of the email preview so it's a huge factor in open rates. So to get people to read your, to open your email, right? So they can read it. So you want to use a person's name um, from the nonprofit. Um, so in place of, or in addition to the organization's name. So the example here, where you have the person's name and the organization, and that is great. And the bottom line here is that, is that email um, is more likely to be opened if it's from a person rather than an organization. So keep that in mind. And then we have the subject line. And the subject line, you don't want to, we could probably do a whole, uh, you know, hour on just subject lines alone. So I'm just going to summarize it here. In your subject line, don't be boring. You don't want to summarize what your email is about. You want to be creative. You want to consider eliciting curiosity, asking a question, expressing some urgency, maybe teasing a story. And check out this example here from, from Orbis. Today, a baby was born eight weeks early, dot, dot, dot. And so I, I didn't write this email. It just, it popped in my inbox um, earlier this month. And I'm a donor and it, I don't read all their emails, of course, because I can't read everyone's emails. But this one grabbed me and you bet I read about it because I wanted to read about this baby. Okay, and then the preview text. Sometimes this is called um, the pre-header text. I don't overlook the importance of this part of your email. Your preview text really should enhance the subject line. So think of the preview text as like an extension of the subject. It's really like your final chance to get your email opened. So you really want to give this part of your email um, a lot of thought as well. And then when you look at that direct mail, let's move on to direct mail. Um, I want you to look at the, th this is something I received recently. It's acquisition solicitation. Look at the outer envelope. Damn, damn, damn. That got my attention. And quickly I opened up the envelope. So the teaser copy got me quickly to open the envelope. And it was actually very emotional and compelling and I ended up giving. And honestly, I had no idea I cared about dams and rivers so much until I read that letter. But that's the power of writing. And one way to make sure that you get it opened is to have great teaser copy. And then number three here, uh, really quick, the appeal opening. So how is this for an opening? And this was the opening of that, of that direct mail appeal. When you know the facts about obsolete dams, you'll be shaking your head and your fist. So that's super engaging. 
you know, it makes me wonder, you know, what's this fight all about? Why should I be, you know, shaking my head in disbelief and then shaking my fists in anger? I, I want to know. So that kept me reading. It got me fast. So next slide. Thank you. Checklist here that you can find in your bonus cheat sheet. Next slide. Thank you, Rachel. All right, so the easy test. And now the easy test, right? You've got your donor's attention, right? You got that in the, in the last test. Now you need to maintain it. And that's really where the easy test comes into play. All right, so taking care of every part of your letter or email means that you are taking care of the person reading your fundraising message. So the purpose of the easy test is, is to ensure that every part of your fundraising piece is easy to understand, right? From the language all the way to the design. Okay, so number one, the problem is easy to understand. All right, so this is really important. So if you're multitasking, I want you to, to kind of lean in and, and, and pay attention to this real quick. The problem that you put in front of your donor really needs to be focused on only one part of what your organization does. It really helps focus your piece on a single problem that the donor can solve with their gift today. Talking about one problem that, that the donor can solve does lessen the other things you do, the other amazing things you do, the other programs you have. It just helps keep the donor focused um, and eager to really make um, an, an, impactful, um, an impactful decision to solve this problem. So you wanna focus on one thing, right? Make it easy, easy like Sunday morning. You really wanna make it easy for the donor just to get it and feel it. And then from your number two, your language, your language needs to be simple and free from jargon. And jargon refers to um, those like special words or expressions that are used by, you know, a particular profession or, you know, group of people. And it's kind of difficult for other people to understand and feel. I should say, we all use jargon. We all use jargon every day. But the important thing is to know when not to use it. And when not to use it is in a fundraising, a fundraising piece. Now, um, you know, think of words that you, you know, use in your organization that may become second nature to you, that maybe fall into the realm of jargon. And that could be like food insecurity or, you know, interdisciplinary or mass incarceration, words like that. But I want you to think about this. Jargon is, is privileged, um, exclusive vocabulary that only a tiny elite um, can really emotionally understand. A tiny elite in your, in your circle can understand. And um, yeah, John, I'm looking at the chat. John says, no acronyms. Yes, no acronyms too. That's, that's, that's similar to jargon. Easy for you, very difficult for the donor. They, they, they just don't get it. And with jargon, you know, insiders like you, you understand the jargon you use. And, and because you are on the ground, you can, you are on the ground, you're like in a lived experience. You, you understand the problem because you see it firsthand day in, day out. You feel it emotionally. As an insider, you feel it. But those of us on the outside of your organization, we like the jargon just doesn't strike an emotional chord. We can understand it intellectually, but we can't feel it. And we want to get our donors to feel because that's how they'll make a decision. So you want to choose language that is simple and inclusive to the people who you want to make a gift. And then three, let's talk about design for a moment. Simple design. Homemade look is okay. Remember, we, we all want to be focused on the message. We don't want to be distracted by, you know, a cool design. You want your appeal letter to look like a letter with lots of white space. Don't produce something that looks like you're going to, you know, submit it to a design contest. 
you know, that's not good. Just you don't get fancy. So it's good news for you. Don't get fancy. Make it look like a letter. And of course, we want things like that Rachel had talked about, larger fonts. We got to keep in mind that our donors are older, that the majority of donors are older. I believe the typical um, or the average age of a donor is around 65 years old. And those of us over 40, we typically have a, a visual impairment. So we want to make sure that we are um, incorporating all of this knowledge into, into our communications. All right. So your appeal images, and you can take a look at these two images I have on the slide. These are from CARE, and they nicely show two types of photos used in different types of fundraising communications. You want to leave the happy photos, like the ones on the right, for your wonderful donor newsletters and other impact reports. But the one on the left, that one shows need. That is for an appeal. All right, next slide, please, Rachel. Thank you. Again, checklist. This is in your bonus cheat sheet. Next slide. Thanks. Okay, offer test. So offer test. In the previous test, uh, easy test, we made sure that like there, you know, that there was a problem that the donor could solve um, and understand that they're the solution for. In this test, we really want to make sure that the donor feels like they can solve the problem and make a significant step towards um, or make a significant step towards the solution, you know, depending on your on your cause. So the purpose of an offer test is to ensure that the donor understands that it's a good value and and they understand the specific impact of their forthcoming gift. OK, so your offer is specific. So the offer should be easy for your donors to visualize. Um, they need to be able to understand where their money is, is going to solve the problem. You want to make it as concrete as possible. And Jeff Brooks, Rachel talked about Jeff Brooks earlier. Um, he says that if you can't take a picture of it, it's not specific enough. It, he says it needs to be photographable like food or backpacks or therapy or research or clean water or clear hiking trails like that. So you want to stay away from conceptual language, like asking the donor to fund hope and healing or confidence. That is too abstract. And when you, when you have an offer like that, when you ask someone to, to donate, to provide hope, and healing, that really kind of takes the teeth out of your offer because it's just not powerful enough. It's not powerful language. And that's what we really want to do in our writing. Okay, then the offer is urgent. So you got to ask why now, right? Why should the donor give today and not sometime in the future? You want your language to evoke um, that urgency, like rush, hurry, reply by August 31st, you want to make your, your appeal urgent, your offer urgent, so that they take action immediately, so they don't put it down or delete your email, that they take action immediately. And the offer is expressed with a cost. So the donor really needs to understand how much it will cost them to make a difference. And you need to tell them. You have to tell them this. They, they can't just infer it. So it's really helpful for the donor if you break down the cost as best you can to get it into its smallest form. So, you know, for example, some offers expressed with a cost could be $50 will bring finding the cure one step closer. Um, $37 will keep 18 off the streets and safe for one week. $1.97, that's a common $1.97 will feed a child for a day. Will you, you may ask, will you um, feed a child for a month? Okay, so you wanna tell the donor how much it costs to make an impact. Now, the donor, um, you need to have the offer feel, you, you want the donor to feel like the offer is a good value. That's the last component. So you wanna, you know, if you look back at the above costs that I just talked about, do those feel like a good deal? I would say yes. 
And I want you to look at your offer. Does it seem like a good deal? Right, we all like good deals. And if it's not, you may wanna drill down a bit more. Also keep in mind matched offers are magic, right? Donors love it when their impact is multiplied. And now here we are, August 16th. Now is a great time in the year to go out to your, um, to your mid-level and major donors and try to, try to pull together matching funds for your year-end appeal. It's really, it's really magical. Next slide, please. Rachel, thank you. Um, again, your checklist in, in your bonus cheat sheet and we'll just move forward. We've got one more, one more slide here. So the heart awakening test. So the, the name of the heart awakening test comes from um, uh, the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy out of the UK and just fantastic research coming from them. I recommend following them. Okay, so writing that passes the heart awakening test really stirs emotions. Um, and it's, it's the kind of vivid writing that may cause the person to like lean in, you know, or, you know, give them goosebumps. Well, if you can give a donor goosebumps, you're gold. And, you know, your writing may, you know, surprise or excite or intrigue the person. And, you know, as Rachel was saying earlier, you know, the, typically the fundraising that does the best, that raises the most money, evokes an emotional response. And you may be familiar with Aristotle's modes of persuasion from, from your school days. And Aristotle created this concept um, to help to help us really like understand the three main ways we persuade people to do something. And it's ethos, logos, and pathos. All of, work, all of these work well together when used in different degrees in your communications. And the type of um, persuasive copy we write will determine what mode we use. So for example, like ethos. Now ethos helps us build credibility and trust. And so for, for, for example, um, this would be like your organization's qualifications and your competence. You probably have a lot of ethos in your grant proposals, but in fundraising, individual donors, it can lead to bragging. And right, donors, we talked about earlier, donors don't want to hear how great you are. They want to hear how great they are through giving to your organization. And then we have logos. And logos appeals to logic and reason, statistics and facts and reasonable arguments and scientific research, all of that. And that can be great, but not in fundraising. Because in fundraising, when you use this type of persuasion, it, it speaks to the part of the brain that is a cheapskate. It says, preserve your money. Don't give it away, right? So when you use a lot of statistics, you make your people overthink the decision. What you want to do is you really want to just touch their heart. And that's what pathos is all about. It, it, pathos evokes an emotional response. You know, it's the heart tugging, heartwarming stories, you know, the personal experiences that represent your mission's work. So, you know, recently I read something that emotions are an emotional magnet. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I'm sorry, emotions are an attention magnet. Emotions are an attention magnet. So you really want to put the emotion, the, the focus on pathos, the emotion. That's why you want to weave a story throughout your appeal, because it really touches people's hearts. The next slide is the checklist and the slide after that. Just really quick, if you want more of this, um, you know, I'm hosting Tom Ahern's next 90 minute webinar on how to write direct mail appeals and he appeals on September 15th. And um, we have an all you can eat Q&A. Last time we did it, it went two and a half hours. So it's really great. And if you want more info, you can go to my website, fundraisingwriting.com. And with that, I'll toss it back to you, Rachel. 
hello, turning back on my, uh, <laughs> I was yeah. muted, turning everything back on again. We all did that because there were some, uh, someone was having trouble logging in there, but yeah, we have some great questions and I'm super excited to yeah. dig through all these. Um, so sure. I'm going to read through some of these. I'm going to let Julie and I'm going to let Josh and anyone can grab whatever they would like. Um, hey, so Rachel, an anonymous person oh, oh. said, Oh, yeah. Can I just real quick. So before we hop in with the questions, we're going to we're going to probably go over the hour. So for those of you who want to uh, stay along, uh, uh, Rachel and Julie have uh, generously uh, given their time and they're, they're willing to go a little bit over. But before we do that, I wanted to just um, we can fire up our last poll here, which is, uh, you know, Julie and Rachel have shared a lot of information. If you'd like additional information or you'd like them to reach out to you directly, or if you'd like additional information on Bloomerang based on today's webinar, um, go ahead and complete that poll. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Rachel, who's going to um, go through the questions. So okay. yeah. like anything to uh, keep, keep sending them in. Yeah. Thanks and if we, if we haven't answered your question, and there were lots of great questions that went into the chat. So if we haven't answered your question, please um, pop it into the Q&A. Uh, I just put a couple links in there. Um, and uh, and yeah, thank you for taking our poll and let us know if we can follow up with you to help you out. I'm going to dig into some of these awesome, awesome questions. Okay. Someone anonymously said, I work for a school and I've got to get out an annual fund solicitation and a capital campaign follow-up solicitation for a new STEM lab. How far apart do they need to be? I feel combining will be detrimental to both. Okay, so here's one formula you can always remember. You ask, you think, and then you report back to your donors. It's a virtuous circle that goes round and round. <laughs> And your donors are not ready to be asked again until you've thanked them and reported back. And the reporting back is telling them how, thanks to you, Julie, kids uh, in you know, uh, San Marcos, Texas are getting a healthy breakfast and lunch every day. And they're going home with a hot meal. And just because their families you know, are in need and can't afford these things, you're making it happen for them, right? So it's not just, and maybe I tell her one little story about a, a one little girl. You need to ask, you need to thank, and you need to report back. So that should inform you on how much time. I feel like, um, you know, I mean, maybe you're at the public stage of your capital campaign. Um, end of year is a pretty big deal. And uh, and you're going to send out multi a well-executed campaign is going to have anywhere from, I mean, depending on your organization, you could have anywhere from like eight to 20 appeals. You could have more than 20 appeals. You could have 50 different appeals, depending on your organization. And um I don't know. I if I if if I were looking at this, I would have end. I would have giving. If I were doing Giving Tuesday and end of year, I would focus on that and maybe do my capital campaign later. But but I don't know the specifics of your organization. But in general, it is an amount of time. There's no like set amount of time. It's really just a function of did I ask them, did I thank them, and did I report back? That, I feel like this is a Julie question. Jessica said, keeping bigger text in mind. How many pages in a direct mail piece should we limit it to? Does that include the return donation page? Oh, Josh, you want to answer this? Oh, no. Did no, I, that I was just marking it that we're reading it. Oh. But I'm <laughs> okay. it Julie. Sorry, Te technical error on my fault. Julie is much more better suited for this than me. <laughs> Josh looked very scared. I'm like, oh, I don't want to answer that. Um, so uh, typically, so what, what works really well is four pages. So that's two sheets both sides. I would definitely recommend that for, especially for your year-end appeal. And why is that? Um, the, the more time you get with the donor reading your piece, your fundraising, the more likely they will donate. And even if they skim it, right? It takes them longer to skim, you know, four pages than it does them to skim, you know, two pages. That's, you know, one sheet, both sides. What also works really well is a full page reply form full page reply form, because then you can get very specific. You can say a special reply form for, and then merge their name in there. And you have all of these things in there that, that, that you can do. You can see if they want to make their gift monthly. You can see if they want information on, you know, putting your organization in their will or trust. You know, there's lots of ways that you can interact with them. Full page reply form. 
Awesome. Okay. I love this question. Someone anonymously said, do you recommend doing an appeal via email or mail? Both, both, both. <laughs> a rising tide lifts all boats. Multi-channel is going to have the biggest lift. So absolutely a hundred percent both. I'm going to keep scrolling. This feels like a Julie question from Kim Peterson on the offer test. What are your thoughts about orgs that don't have tangible cost? As in the example, our $50 won't really cover anything that makes sense, possibly moving towards a more mission-centric, cost-centric messaging. So, you know, so for example, I don't know what your, what your um, cause is, but even like if it's research, you know, like, like cancer research, you know, you, you, you can't really say, you know, how much, you know, like a beaker costs. You can't do like a 16th of a beaker, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't do that, but you can say that, you know, for example, $50 will help move, will, will move the mission one step forward, will help bring, bring the cure to breast cancer one step closer. So you, you kind of have to use that sort of language um, when you don't have something like super tangible, like a backpack or a, you know, puppy. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to answer something that I feel like this is a little bit of a landmine, but I'm going in and I'm going to invite Julie and Josh to hop into this, um, this pile of sand with me too. And, and then we're going to definitely cover Molly's question, which is a really, another really great, uh, copywriting question for our copywriting guru, Julie Cooper. But Katie asked this question and a lot of people have been asking and expressing concerns and stress and anxiety around the dignity of their clients and using photographs of their clients. And Katie asked, can you speak to the tension between evoking emotional response and the challenge of protecting the, the dignity of the clients most of our organizations serve? Okay, so my first piece of advice is you do not, it's great to use photos of your clients, but if you cannot do that, and many organizations can't, you can use stock photos. You could use, you could use, I've seen organizations use photos of like, just like waist down, like a little kid's feet, you know, no, there's no, you can't see an identity. You can use stock photos. There are so many great websites and anyone who uses great stock photos, I encourage you to pop into the chat what your favorite one is. Um, you can Google it. There are it takes Pixabay. Oh, here I am. I have a list of great free stock photos up on my wall. Uh, negativespace.co, death to the stock photo.com, <laughs> stock map.io. I already put unsplash in there. Pixabay, librestock.com. Those are like some um, free or inexpensive stock photos. You're going to have to do a little bit of work to get free high quality stock photos. I'm not going to lie. You're, it's not going to be the first photo you see, and you're not going to want to buy the first photo you see on adobe.com. Ooh, Sandy says death to stock photo has such great unique photos. Oh, but there you go. Use that one. Um, but I want to let everyone off the hook here on feeling guilty. And I want you to know that you probably are beating yourself over this way more than any other humans and your donors are not, you know, the insider language, you know, how the sausage gets made way more than your donors. Your donors just want to help make the world a better place. And you're just putting a great opportunity in front of them to do that. And you shouldn't feel guilty about using a photo of someone in need. You're helping people in need. If you're not comfortable with using their identity, use a stock photo. It's, it's okay. You're not a bad person. What would you guys like to add there, if anything? Yeah. And sometimes you know, the, the, the people who you're showing, you know, if you have access to them, they would want you to show that they want you to show the reality of their life. So it's honoring them too. And their story. I mean, absolutely. You want to, you know, amplify, you know, the dignity and, and the commitment of, of, of your beneficiaries. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, stock photos are, are excellent are an excellent alternative. 
Yeah, one of the uh, things that we've seen with our customers is um, you don't necessarily, you can tell the story of the client, but you can also tell the story of another volunteer and why they're involved and why it's important to them that they're donating or donating their time, right? And take that spin on it. And you can oftentimes then, or a board member, right? And you can then uh, put the image or them in action or them, you know, if it's a food pantry, sorting food or, you know, whatever that may be. So think about it from various different angles is what I would, uh, my advice would be. That's really great advice, Josh. And just to, just to add to that, that's why you need multiple emails because you, you're just not a one trick pony. You are, you can do it from different angles. You have different approaches from a volunteer, from a donor, you, um, from a beneficiary, from, you know, so you, you can do all of that. You can, you, you can do all of that in your fundraising. Um, you just, you just have to, you know, be committed to writing different pieces as well. Absolutely. Um, I love what Gail said. I just got to brag on Gail. She said, I often get to interview our shelter residents and they are so willing to be photographed for stories. They love the chance to help. And I think this is so beautiful. I just want to give Gail like a big hug here, because I think this is the part that we forget, like in our worry and our stress and our anxiety about like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, this is, I'm taking advantage of these people. You're not, you're helping people in need and they want to help you too. I, I'm not naming any names, but there's an organization that I love a lot. And there was a, there was a conflict situation between uh, one department, the program department and the development department where the program department literally said to a client, aren't doesn't it make you feel bad that we wrote this story about how you were in need no <laughs> the client was honored to get to help the organization that had helped her so much and i really think that like if you're having those thoughts and feelings you need to realize that you may be projecting those thoughts and feelings onto other people that don't feel that way at all and you maybe need to you know uh, kind of check yourself before you uh, go down that road because you could be beating yourself up, making yourself feel bad about something that you shouldn't feel bad about. And, 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 and like, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. I interrupted you. I'm so sorry, but I was, I was just really excited. And, be, and you can take that story and it, take it into your newsletter and show how when you know when the when when the donor gave. They gave opportunity to the beneficiary. And what did the beneficiary do? They grabbed it with both hands and look at them now. So that's how you can also elevate the beneficiary too in your writing. Absolutely. I absolutely love that. So you guys are really hot on uh, stock photos. So I just put one link in there and anyone else who has stock photos, I mentioned gratisography like g r a t i s o g r a p h y.com pixabay and librestock.com those are just a few um here's a here's a copywriting question for julie what do you think about not having a reply slip and just having a qr code that goes directly to the donation page and the website link on the appeal i know what i think about this i don't do like that i don't like, I don't like it, at it either all. I, I am all, I'm all for the, putting the QR code in addition to a reply form. I mean, you, you're, send, you're sending them a direct mail piece. Remember, our donors, the average age is 65. These people, they are they're wonderful people and they love sending, they love direct mail. They, and they will send you money back. So you, you have a bunch of people who are willing to send you money don't don't do it halfway you're sending them an appeal send them a reply form send them an envelope don't forget the envelope self-addressed envelope you know back to you do do all the things because it works right we're, we're not it's not just pie in the sky it works do the things i love the things <laughs> Uh, awesome. Okay. So we've got, um, this is a good one from Adrian. Is there a better time to send out the year end appeal letter, October, November, or December? Everyone does things differently. One thing that we know from hanging out with you guys are, um, our beautiful friends is that we do not think you are sending out enough appeals and we want you to send out more appeals. Um, and it just depends. I mean, I know organizations that start in September. I know organizations that start in October. It depends on you, 
what you've done in the past with your donors, what you're planning to do right now, what your resources are, what your cadence is, what would you add to that, Julie? Yeah, I totally agree because sometimes people have like an event in October and things that, you know, you, so, so you have to look at your whole calendar and see what makes sense. You know, it's great. I mean, if you want, if you want a date, try to target around Thanksgiving or sooner. Um, if you're doing a second mail, if you're doing a second appeal via mail, then you want to do that, you know, like, you know, like mid-December, like, or, you know, December 12th. Um, so, it, so it depends on all of those things. Then, you know, how many, how many direct mail appeals are you sending out at the end of the year and, and events and, and all of that. So yeah, October uh, may be a little early, but definitely in November around Thanksgiving, you definitely want to have it out there and keep in mind too, the post office has been slow. Yes. I have seen, I mean, no, no offense to them. You know, they're great. We all love them, but the, it's the mail has been slow. I've been getting, I've had, so anyway, mail has been slow. So you want to keep that in mind and printers, printers, you, you got to talk to your printer, your mail house to make sure their timeline matches your timeline. So you can get it out, you know, when you want. Uh, Paula asked in North Texas, we have North Texas giving day in September. Should we also do an ask for giving Tuesday along with the year and appeal? Is that too much? No, not too much. As long as you ask and you thank, and you report back your donors, not ready to give again until they have been thanked and reported back to meaning you told them how much their gift made a difference. I've had a few people that have asked this in the chat and at least one person I think asked this in the Q and A and this is juicy. So um, a lot of people have asked, what about I'm doing, I'm taking Julie's awesome advice and I'm doing this offer and I'm writing my end of year appeal and I've got one really great call to action but what if I want to use the money kind of in a general way? Like, what if I want to use the money? So I'm going to give you some tips here and I'm going to invite Julie to add anything that she would like. And of course, anything, anything else you guys want to answer. So um, tying the ass to something tangible doesn't limit your ability. Here's three ways to get around it. Somewhere in the appeal, you can add your gift will not only help this project, but will help in many other ways, okay? Like it's vague, it's nebulous, but it says there. You can also have it on your reply device. Please use my gift now to help, you know, the local herd of unicorns and other yeah. endangered species around the world. <laughs> Josh is like, unicorns? <laughs> uh, you could also have an internal policy around um, use of funds. Like in, if we exceed our fundraising goals for this project, we are going to distribute it where the money is needed most. So I hope those three things make you feel off the hook. Take a deep cleansing breath because Julie and I want you, Julie and Josh and Sarah and I want you to just feel all the love and all the joy and all the happiness. And I want to say that fundraising is a lot of work. You've got a big cause and you've got a big mission and you're not here to play small and you're not, you're also not here to offend as few people as possible. You're here to raise money for your cause and do amazing work. And just to give everyone a deep, like, we love you and we're in this with you and we're here to help you. I love this quote, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. We can't do all the things. I can't do all the things. My goodness, I do my best and I let it go. And tomorrow's another day. Like what other advice do you have around that, Julie or Josh, that you want to share with people? Or any other questions that we need to answer yeah. here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think awesome. you did. it's one step at a time, right? Really, you got to sort of, yeah, one step at a time. Don't try and do it all at the same time, right? You just got to sort of, Chunk it out. Spike yeah, it. And, and you have to consider your capacity too, right? Because we, we, we don't want you to get burnt out. We don't want you to get burnt out and quit, right? So, so you have to consider what you have to work with. And sometimes you may have, and you may have to say, okay, this year end, we can do these things. Next year, we're going to plan and we're going to start in June, right? And we're going to start earlier. And so that we can do more of those things. So, you know, be, be kind to yourself as well. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And, um, you know, if you did, you know, add one or two or three things from this webinar and then next year add more, right? And so exactly. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I love what 
I love what Megan wrote because this is like me. Megan's like, what do, what would you do if you don't love the theme of the year end appeal because it doesn't follow the tips you've discussed today, but the letters aren't even written. What I would do is rewrite it. And actually, I'm going to pop this in the chat. I have a little rewrite that makes it really, really super easy, but I would rewrite it, my fundraising friend, using the tips here. I would take you through the checklist, the free checklist. Just taking it through the free checklist, you could do a little nip and a little tuck here and there and make it a little bit better. You could make it more donor centric. You could do that totally for free. Um, but yeah, uh, that would be my advice. Do your very best. I mean, here's the thing. You're going to raise more money. And I want you to raise more money. Josh wants you to raise more money. Julie wants you to raise more money. Like that's the thing that always kills me. And I'm still blown away that 97% of you do all your own stunts. And I do all my own stunts too. I mean, I'm a one person shop here, um, but I'm blown away that 97% of you are doing your own fundraising copywriting. I take fundraising copywriting seriously as a heart attack because what's on the line is your organization's future and all the money that you're going to raise. And I take it more seriously than probably anyone I've ever worked with. I know Julie takes it seriously too. And that's why we put so much effort into every single word. And we want you to do the same thing, Megan. Like we want you to put every effort into making it the best that it could be because improving it now could take it from raising $5,000 to raising $100,000. And wouldn't you rather have $100,000? I'd rather you have $100,000. Me too. Me too. Yeah. You deserve it. You all deserve it so much. You have amazing causes. All right. Um, well, with that, with, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up. Here's the, here's the story. I know there was more questions than we had time for. We're going to send them over to Rachel and Julie. If they have a moment, I know they will love to reach out um, and answer them. Tons of really good resources. Rachel, I'm going to ask you if you can send over the lists of the links. And what we'll do is we'll try and get those yes. links in the email. Um, and then we'll also try and embed them in the um, the landing page where we'll host the video. So you all will have access to that. And then um, also, Rachel, I have this started as a, an email, but let me just ask you right now so everyone knows. If you could, if you wouldn't mind sending over your list of free stock photo. Yes, uh, you bet. We'll, we'll include that in the landing page um, where the video will be embedded. Uh, and so you all, because there's a lot of questions around that. Um, and yes. With, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oops, oh, sorry. I was going to say, like, I haven't used all of these. I've got like <laughs> seven different sites. I haven't used all of them. So if you, if you guys click on one and you don't like it, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> We'll do, we'll do a quick, uh, you know, PG test before we post them, but I can't imagine that you would send me anything that couldn't go in there anyway. Uh, but with that, we are so grateful for your time, uh, for the time today, Julie and Rachel, you always bring such great uh, tips and ideas to our audience. And we are thankful for that for you, uh, fearless fundraisers out there. We know this is the season. It's starting to heat up, even though it's starting to cool down outside. Uh, we are all here for you. So please feel free to reach out to Rachel or Julie or the team over at Bloomering. I um, mean, we wish you all the best um, as you prepare for year end fundraising. Uh, we know you're going to knock it out of the park uh, because each and one of you are talented in your own ways and are going to really just uh, hit, hit the goals this year. So with that, until next time, uh, we will uh, we'll see you all. Have a great afternoon. Bye, Bye all. Everyone.